A quiet, familiar scene. Children playing, happy in their own backyard, or if the whim exists, over the fence to a neighbor's. This could be their fence, barbed, electrified, impassable. As our children play unfettered, 79 millions of their cousins are locked in the giant cage that is the communist Iron Curtain. Recently, 60 American citizens flew to the Iron Curtain to observe how fellow Americans are breaking through this barrier of censorship, security police, radio jamming, and barbed wire to bring the voice of freedom within this eagle cage. American Army helicopters flying to the Czech border. The Americans within these 10 aircraft represent many phases of our way of life. A steel executive, the mayor of Newark, a woman from a farm in Kansas, the sister of a former secretary of state, a bank president, a federal judge. The tour was sponsored by the Radio Free Europe Fund, a private non-profit American organization which supports RFE's anti-communist broadcast to five captive countries, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania, and Bulgaria, five prisoner nations that form a barrier to freedom. Their peoples live within a giant cage that is the Iron Curtain. It is a tangible thing, it is real. You can see it, touch it, hear it. It is a barrier of barbed wire and observation towers of rigged newspapers, films, magazines, and the noise of a radio set being jammed. The Honorable Mrs. Eleanor Lansing Dulles, Minister for the United States, was among the group that inspected this seemingly quiet, peaceful Czech border. The people here, as in all five of the Russian buffer states, have been imprisoned since 1950, when the communists installed their puppet leaders in these East European countries. A deceptive scene, just a few miles away, over 79 million captives. This is a job of watching. E.K. Hartenbauer, general manager of KCMO Broadcasting Company, Kansas City, Missouri, is not aware that he is under constant surveillance by the communists in the foreboding watchtowers. Field glasses and machine guns are continually trained on all within range. The Russians watch to see who comes in and that no one gets out. In 1948, an actual iron curtain consisting of electrified barbed wire, armed patrols, land mines, and guard towers was built to divide Eastern and Western Europe. Behind the barbaric structure, a gigantic brainwashing operation is in full swing, penetrating and blanketing every level of the captives' lives with communist ideology and anti-Western propaganda. One of their tools is to set up a monopoly of all communication media, radio, press, theater, public forums, to hope that the captives hear only communist radio, read only communist newspapers, see only communist drama, films, opera, and art, and form their attitudes toward the West solely on the basis of what they are fed by this all-embracing propaganda apparatus. Given time enough, the communist plan seemed certain of success. The memories and hopes of the older generations would be deadened, and the youth would belong wholly to the communist state. Symbolic of their plans is the Iron Curtain. But not only do the communists watch the free world, the free world is also keeping constant 24-hour-a-day surveillance on them. Here at Camp Ritz, Colonel Robert E. Erlenbush of the 11th Armored Cavalry patrols one section of the Eagle Cage. Almost daily, the communist guards have to remove a dog or a rabbit, perhaps a horse or cow, that has strayed into the wire and been electrocuted. Once there was a thriving Czech village just beyond the fence. The communists tore it down. They couldn't risk having that many people so close to freedom. At this American outpost, a few score troops are continually ready. Troop carrying half-tracks are parked, fueled, armed, and ready to move. Machine gun-bearing jeeps stand in the muddy camp street. This is not a maneuver. This is not a war game. It's real. 
These are the extremities of two giants ready to grapple. Systematic patrols are used, with each group moving along the border for 12 and 24 hour periods. The return to freedom is easy for some. Skimming the treetops at 90 miles per hour reveals the misty snow-covered Bavarian countryside. And as the Iron Curtain fades in the fog, there is little to disclose the tension below. The words of President Eisenhower sum up the situation. People believe lies only when they have no opportunity to hear the truth. The communists have isolated their people to keep them from ever hearing the truth, to create a vacuum in their minds, which will absorb lies because there is nothing else for them to seize upon. The only way to frustrate this evil manipulation of human minds and emotions is to supply the truth which gives the oppressed people a measuring stick to lay against each lie that is told to them. Radio Free Europe is supplying the truth. Men and women who might otherwise have succumbed to the philosophy that it is good to be slaves still keep alive the spark of freedom in their hearts. This work serves not only the nations we seek to help, it serves the best interests of the United States. So spoke President Eisenhower. Radio Free Europe began broadcasting from Munich on July 4th, 1950. In the intervening decade, in spite of repeated and continued sabotage attempts, the most recent being an unsuccessful mass poisoning of its staff, the station has grown to 28 powerful transmitters and is on the air with almost 3,000 hours of programs a week. As a continual reminder of the barrier that must be broken, a model of the first Iron Curtain is on display here at the main studios in Munich. Mówi rozgłośnia Polska Radia Wolna Europa. Dzień dobry Państwu. Sobot Europa Radio. Jurek Gelskę. Dobry jutro Wasi posłuchaci. Hlásí se vám Československá stanice rozhlasu Spodobná Evropa. These are the voices of Radio Free Europe. The man behind these sounds is the European director of RFE, Eric Hazelhoff. He is a man schooled in international intrigue and particularly well fitted to direct the operation of anti-communist radio stations. Born in Java of Dutch parents, he received his Doctorate of Laws degree from the University of Leiden in Holland. After spending 14 months in Nazi-occupied Holland, he escaped to England, joining the RAF. After the war, he came to America and became a U.S. citizen in 1954. Before going with Radio Free Europe in 1957, he worked for NBC as a writer, editor, and producer. Dr. Clarence Decker, academic vice president of Fairleigh Dickinson University, is among the group of 60 Americans inspecting these facilities. RFE, supported entirely by contributions from Americans to the Radio Free Europe Fund, has gained a reputation for truth and reliability in its five target countries, despite the best efforts of the communists to discredit it. One of the world's largest radio monitoring plants is the focus of RFE's vast monitoring service. Phelps H. Adams of the United States Steel listens to one of the more than 60 communist radio stations and news services. This wide-scale listening in on the communist line as it is fed to the captive peoples through local home service broadcasts produces immense advantages for RFE's policy and programming experts. Herbert B. Cahan of Westinghouse Broadcasting hears some of the wealth of programming material that is an equally important product of the monitoring service. Inevitably, there are differences between what the home audience is told and the official propaganda directed to the free world. RFE is quick to point out such discrepancies and the hypocrisy which underlies them. Supplementing the monitoring intake is RFE's constant analysis of over 700 communist newspapers and periodicals. Radio Free Europe is the voice of truth for the people of Eastern Europe. It exposes lies, abuses, and subterfuges of the communist propaganda. It says for the captive people, what they cannot say for themselves. Here at the central news desk of RFE, information comes from all over the world. New York teletype, Western news agencies, field bureaus, interviews, radio monitoring, and the communist press. The world's largest and most concentrated flow of iron curtain information pours into RFE's Munich headquarters. In its 24-hour operational day, the central newsroom alone gathers and processes over a million words of world news. 
called the watchdogs of Radio Free Europe, the five evaluation and analysis units safeguard the station against going on the air with incorrect information. This is done by checking all data which flows in from the field bureau and other sources against the personal knowledge of the unit staff and against the vast amount of codified information, seven million entries contained in RFE's card index files. A part of this file consists of refugees and their families on either side of the Iron Curtain. This painstaking, unromantic work is one of the foundation stones of Radio Free Europe's existence. Upon it is based the network's reputation for credibility and integrity. Eisenhower, amerikai elnök ismertette azokat a feltételeket, amelyek mellett... This is the sound of a Hungarian newscast. Here at Radio Free Europe's master control room, five different programs in five languages emanate daily to RFE shortwave transmitters throughout Free Europe. Programs of truth. The captives hear programs on law, medicine, child care, even meal planning with available local foods, music, and the all-important news. Over 17% of the programming is news, food for starving millions. Each of the 60 visiting Americans made a statement of hope that was translated into the five languages. As we watch others recording, here is the voice of E.K. Hartenbauer reporting to the people of the United States. After studying this powerful nonprofit network, I can assure you that RFE is America's most effective weapon against communist propaganda in the captive countries of East Europe. Khrushchev has boasted that your grandchildren will live under communism. Help prove the communist wrong by supporting Radio Free Europe. Please give generously through your local fundraising drive or send your contribution to Radio Free Europe, Box 1961, Mount Vernon 10, New York. One of RFE's programs is called the Black Scroll. Its purpose is to expose the more flagrant abuses of authority of the communists. It also exposes undercover agents of the secret police. There are many verified instances of agents being reassigned after exposure on this program. There are also many cases of people who have been warned in time that those they thought were friends were in fact working for the regime. What is the effectiveness of the broadcasts? In 1959, when Vice President Nixon visited Warsaw, RFE broadcast the arrival time in his place of residence. 250,000 Poles turned out to greet him more than it greeted Khrushchev, whose crowd was padded with people shipped in from other towns. Thirty miles outside Lisbon, Portugal, is the main shortwave transmitter site of RFE. Here at the Gloria Transmitting Center, 24 transmitters are used for broadcasting simultaneously in five languages. The programs fed to these main transmitters for broadcast to the captive countries originate in Munich, New York, and Holzkirchen, Germany. The transmitter site here in Portugal is an ideal location for transmission on frequencies beamed toward the east. By bouncing the radio waves off ionosphere, great distances can be covered. Naturally, the installation is under maximum security at all times as the communists have tried much to silence these voices of freedom. A continual tribute to the success of RFE. The buildings and grounds cover 480 acres and are under armed guard around the clock. Continually, a blimp hovers over the area, keeping constant surveillance and monitoring the output of the transmitters. The Iron Curtain is highly effective in preventing escape from the communist paradise, but it is powerless to stop radio waves. For that task, the communists employ an iron curtain of a different, less tangible sort, radio jamming. This is the sound of communists trying to silence Radio Free Europe. It is an expensive sound. It is the sound of jamming. 2,500 communist stations broadcasting noise on various wavelengths. It cost them an estimated $250 million to build and $100 million a year to run. The very fact they have to do it raises questions in the minds of people all over the world, including bright young communists. But Radio Free Europe has the power to break through well over a million watts, dancing elusively from frequency to frequency. And thus, RFE is getting through with the voice of the Freedom Bell 
to more devoted and loyal listeners than can be claimed by almost any other radio system in the world. The programs are getting through to their audiences. One reason is that the captives patiently work to get through to the programs. A poll of Hungarian refugees shows that 93% were hearing RFE programs. Giant relays automatically change the broadcast frequency of the program and communist jamming is successfully evaded. This jam-proof saturation service directs nearly all transmitters for 20 minutes at a time to each of the target countries. Radio Free Europe is a distinctively different operation, which creates a feeling in each imprisoned country that here is a friendly local station attuned to the hearts and hopes of the people of that particular country. The greatest hope of these people in becoming free and self-determining nations once again lies within their own borders. To that end, the voices of freedom serve the aspirations of the captive peoples by providing the truth and sustaining the spirit of freedom. Flying on to Berlin, on the left, the mayor of Newark, New Jersey, Leo P. Carlin, looks forward to meeting his counterpart, Willie Brandt. The occasion, the celebration of the 10th anniversary of the Freedom Bell. The host, John M. Patterson, president of Radio Free Europe, is also in the crowd, arriving in Berlin, and the group is met by the traditional official greeter, the famous Berlin Bear. Visiting dignitaries have always been embraced by this friendly fellow as they arrive. And immediately on arriving in Berlin, the group is loaded into two special army buses bound for the Russian sector. This trip is contrary to prearranged schedule in order to throw the communist police off guard and to avoid incident or demonstration. The plan works. And although a Russian police car tails the group throughout the tour, Nothing is said and nothing happens. There is hardly a car on the streets. The main downtown intersection is almost deserted. Just here and there a person hurrying in the rain. Shop windows are sparsely decorated, poorly lighted, and street after street lined with bombed out shells of buildings, still standing 15 years after the war's end. A specter of communism, its dark bleak shrouds wrapped tight. All is silence. The buses, crossing back into the western sector, find a bustling, thriving, happy city. The bombed out buildings and the rubble mostly cleared away. Brightly lighted shop windows are packed with goods. The streets are jammed with people and automobiles. This is a living city, dynamic and enterprising. The communists have announced that they will rebuild their eastern sector and overtake the western by 1965. If they succeed, then the spiritual drabness of communism will be even more apparent. The 18th century Brandenburg Gate, built in the time of Bach, Goethe, and Schiller, is now the dividing line between free West Berlin and communist East Berlin. Nearby, in the western sector, stands the monument to the Russian unknown soldier, built by the communists before Berlin was divided. It is now the only existing Russian memorial in free Berlin. The Soviet honor guard has been allowed to remain. Although Berlin is more than 100 miles behind the Iron Curtain, the courageous people of this city, with American aid and encouragement, continue to keep West Berlin free year after year in the face of communist pressures and threats. Berlin has become a beacon of faith to the captive peoples behind the Iron Curtain and indeed a symbol of the struggle of free men everywhere to preserve their free societies. Since the dark day of the Berlin blockade, when the airlift kept the city alive, there has been a deep bond between the people of Berlin and the United States. Another of the many American contributions to our deep friendship with the people of Berlin is America House. Here, just steps away from the Iron Curtain, is a library. To us, that doesn't sound impressive. Just a library built and equipped for the people of Berlin by their friends in the United States. But to a civilization rich in cultural heritage, it is more than food. It is more than money. It is truth. It is hope. At the library, 
they may learn of Wolfe, Jefferson, and St. Luke. Not only do the people of Free Berlin use its facilities, but the few from the Russian zone that are allowed to cross over come to this free library continually. Here they find escape from Soviet lies and propaganda. Here there is no brainwashing. Here they find the truth. And for a moment, the door to the eagle cage is open. Americans were also instrumental in the construction of Tiergarten Congress Hall. This magnificent new structure symbolizes the restoration, growth, and development that has taken place in free Germany since the end of the war. A member of this group that is inspecting American contributions in Germany, Mrs. Eleanor Lansing Dulles, was one of the benefactors for this cause. When the East German Communists assumed control of Berlin's Humboldt University, located in the Soviet sector, faculty and students organized the Free University in West Berlin as their contribution to the forward growth of education in the free world. American citizens aided in building these dormitories for the university. This free university of Berlin, established at the height of the blockade by popular demand of the students who could no longer tolerate communist domination in the old university in the Soviet sector, continues to operate under democratic principles. This is a Korean youth working on his doctor's degree in education. The Burgermeister of the school is similar to our class president. A third of the students come from the Soviet sector to learn of liberty and of freedom's ways. And beyond, again, always near, the Russian zone. This time blocking off the historic Potsdam Road. This was once one of the major arteries of Berlin. Now, weeds and underbrush. In the distance, a Soviet sentry guarding watching, waiting. As the Americans continued their tour, the East German Communist-controlled news agency said, 60 American espionage agents are presently traveling in Germany in order to promote provocations against socialist countries. There will also be negotiations with leading members of the espionage broadcasting station Radio Free Europe. Above it all, high atop the Berlin City Hall, where its voice can be heard by the oppressed, is the Berlin Freedom Bell. In 1950, it was given to the people of Berlin by the people of America. The bell commemorates the struggle of free people everywhere against the menace of communism. Inspired by our own Liberty Bell in Philadelphia, the Freedom Bell was cast in Croydon, England, the same city which cast the American Bell 200 years before. This is Mayor Willie Brandt the host of the 10th anniversary celebration of the dedication of this 10-ton bell. The bell is the symbol of the Crusade for Freedom, the organization which supports Radio Free Europe. Sculptured on the side of the bell are figures representing the five races of man passing the torch of freedom. The inscription around the bell's base reads that this world, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. The Freedom Bell has rung at noon every day for the past 10 years. Outside the West Berlin City Hall, a large crowd has gathered to greet the Americans here for the celebration and to pay homage to General Frank L. Howley, formerly Berlin Commandant, in charge of the airlift. The rededication of the Freedom Bell represents 10 years of progress for the crusade for freedom and radio-free Europe. Without both the small and large contributions of millions of Americans, this project could have never been undertaken. The consequences without Radio Free Europe would have been immeasurable. 
Mayor Willie Brandt expressed the gratitude of both the free and the enslaved peoples of Europe when he said, we couldn't have defended our freedom and we could not have rebuilt this city if we had not the support of our friends abroad. And it is no exaggeration if I say that the defense and the reconstruction of Berlin is a fine symbol of cooperation between the people of the United States and the people living here at this place. I just want to thank you once more for coming to Berlin, for all the assistance the government and the people of the United States have given to my city, and I want to add another word of gratitude. We appreciate very much that the members of the Crusade for Freedom and Radio Free Europe are doing a wonderful job for not only the defense of freedom in Europe and other parts of the world, but also in order to regain freedom where it has been lost. I think this work will get an important chapter when the history of this time one day is put on paper. So spoke Willie Brandt. When the Freedom Bell was dedicated, General Lucius D. Clay had inspiring words that well apply to Radio Free Europe. May its voice lift the hearts of freedom-loving people everywhere. From this day forward as it rings, may it strike a note of warning to all oppressors, a sound of confidence and courage to those called upon to defend their freedom, a message of hope and sympathy to those who are enslaved. Thank you.